ورحمه الله تعالى وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى اله واصحابه واتباعه الى يوم الدين اللهم فقهنا في الدين وعلمنا التاويل والهمنا بفيد فضلك رشدنا يا رب العالمين الحمد لله in our classes on Imam Ghazali's Ihya, the revival of the religious sciences, we are looking at the book of travel. And we began at looking at the reality of travel, and the purpose of travel. And then we looked at some of the key sunnas and adab, proper manners related to travel. Today, as we come to the close of, of this important section, we will be looking ta'ala at some of what the traveler needs to know. Right? Imam, and Imam Ghazali looks um, at six key six key rulings related to travel. Six key rulings related to travel. So Imam al-Ghazali begins by saying something deeply powerful, right? Which is that he says, اعلم أن المسافرة يحتاج يحتاج في أول سفره أن يتزود لدنياه وآخرته. Know well that the traveler, when they begin the, their travel, needs to prepare their provision, right, to be prepared both to fulfill their worldly interests, because they're traveling for some reason but also to be prepared for your hereafter. That Imam Ghazali sort of looks at things with a bigger picture always. That when you begin a journey, you need to be prepared. You can't say, I'm going to Miami. Your friend asks you, how? Then, you know, I'll go into the border and then I'll see what happens. No, you go prepared. Similarly, he says, likewise for the hereafter, that you are a servant of Allah, so there's things that you need to take care of to be able to worship Allah when you travel. So he explains this. He says, dunya, As for the provision of this world, he said that is clear. What is it? It is your food, your drink, and what you need of financial means to make it to your destination. And normally, those are taken care of, and that's not really the subject directly of religious t teachings. You know, we make sure there the guiding principle is that if you on import in, in any trip, we strive to make our journey with the halal and the tayyib. You want to take the family out for a summer, you know, or for a vacation that will be blessed. What should you do? What should you do? It's an, uh, an important factor that you strive to make your, you know, that, that journey with halal and tayyib money. So for example, you, someone has family back home in, let's say Syria, for example. And on that, so you're, and due to the current events, you've not gone for years. But now you're able to go. One of the practical things you do, that any journey of significance, whether it's Hajj or Umrah, or you reconnecting with family members you lost track of, or you've had trouble as a couple. Jack and Jill were fighting up and down the hill of life. Now they're saying, okay, let's go on a journey. So you seek to make the provision of the journey, halal and tayyib. One of the ways to do that, let's say Jack went down funny routes in, in life. One of the things you do to make it a blessed reconnection, the ulama say is, of course you repent and so on, but if you have questionable earnings, then you borrow some money that is tayyib. Okay? Because the bor borrowed money is per permissible. And you go on the journey with that pure money. Of course, this not, does not allow you to work shady jobs and then just borrow money for the trip. 
But you know, if someone's working in like I was on one trip and sometimes there's not much you can say. The sister who converted in South America, she came to a program and says, I teach belly dancing. What do I do? And apparently that's all. So now, and sometimes, you know, someone's not ready for an answer. So what do you do? So you tell them, learn your deen, take the steps and so on. Next trip I went to the same country, Argentina, says now I, I teach women um, I forget it was yoga or something else, right? Which is certainly much better, you know. It's not belly dancing, alhamdulillah. So now if one's inside that kind of situation, your earnings were from something questionable. Now, of course, you have to know what to do with questionable earnings. But at a practical level, if you have that kind of situation, when you're traveling, particularly for the travel of significance, borrow money. So you, you travel with that the halal and tayyib, both for the religiously obligatory travel, or religiously important travel, Hajj and Umrah, or you're going for some program for religious or spiritual growth, or to other high motives. You want to reconnect with long lost family or whatever. This is one of the ways. Why? Because we know from the hadith of our beloved messenger that Allah is pure and He accepts only the pure. And one of the times, and the hadith mentions the person who was on a long journey. And they were dirty and disheveled. Yet, right? yet, and you know, they were dirty, disheveled, and in despair, raising their hands to the sky, begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb. But their food and their drink and their provision was from the haram. So the Prophet said, So from where would their dua be answered? So this is one of the practical things in terms of. The worldly means for a journey. Um, but then Imam Ghazali continues. But there's also next worldly provisions. What is the next worldly provisions on your journey? Imam Ghazali says. The next worldly provisions on your journey is knowledge. Why? Because when you travel you are a servant of God. How do you serve Allah? Through knowledge. Because what is to, to serve Allah is for the act is for to be in a state of obedience to Allah is for the actions of the servant to be in accordance with the command of the Lord. Correct? How do you know that what you're doing is in accordance with the command of Allah? Through knowledge. Right? And so that's why. If you're going on a journey, you need to know about how to be in a state of purification and prayer. If it's Ramadan, the rulings related to fasting, other acts of, of, of devotion that are obligatory, or the acts of devotion that are recommended. Um, there's, so that's, and that's an opportunity. So if we talk about, firstly, the religiously obligatory duties that we have, a practical thing to do, you know, a practical thing to do is if you're going on a significant journey, Hajj, Umrah, and you're reconnecting with the deen. You want to, you've had an opportunity to go and you're, so you're going to go for 10 days, two weeks, whatever. And you know, months in advance, take that as an opportunity to learn or renew your knowledge of your obligatory duties. for a religiously significant trip, particularly Hajj. You're going for Umrah. So you plan everything. One of the most practical things you plan is, one of the most practical things you plan is, how do I fulfill my, you know, my, my prayer, my worship in a good way in general. Right? In our times, a lot of us might not know the rulings of prayer properly, etc., so one learns. And then there's certain rulings that are specific to the travel, which we'll look at six key areas specifically. Similarly, this is something really blessed. And if you want divine favor, one of the best things to do to seek divine favor, you want Allah you know, to give you 
facilitation. Keep, keep in mind an important principle that's there in the Quran. In tansurullaha yansurkum. If you give victory to Allah, Allah will give victory to you. So you're going. You, know, you, you're, you had a big fa fallout with your family members back home or your parents did. Now you're going back to reconnect. And you want Allah's assistance because there's big fights in the family. There was gunshots involved and attempted murder charges and all kinds of drama. So what do you do? You know, of course you make your plans, but take care of the rights of Allah. Okay, I want to go there. I want Allah's assistance. Learn the most important thing that you seek Allah's favor with is what Allah has made obligatory upon you. We know from the hadith of electhood, the Prophet ﷺ tells us that Allah Most High says, as part of a longer hadith, my servant draws close to me by nothing more beloved to me than what I have made obligatory upon them. And my servant continues to draw close to me through supererogatory works until I love them. Sometimes people say, okay, I'll give a little bit in charity, I'll do this. Best thing you can do to seek Allah's favor is commit to fulfill the rights of Allah. And this is, applies to big journeys in life, but also big steps in life. You want a blessed marriage, first thing to do, take care of your, le, renew your knowledge of the core rulings of religion. Why? Because you want divine, you want divine assistance, commit to give, to put Allah first in your life. So, so that's one component, right? To, to, to make knowledge happen in your life. Then there are rulings specific to travel and our worship that we need to be aware of. The first of these is to know about wearing footgear, hoofs. So we, we should learn as part of knowing our fiqh of worship that a traveler can wipe for three days. A traveler can wipe over footgear for three days. In the across the schools of Islamic law, you can wipe over leather footgear for sure. And then there's some differences. It's not primarily a fiqh class, and you can see the resources we have. You, you know, um, whether it's leather footgear or thick footgear, ideally that's waterproof or at least that's thick and sturdy. You can wipe over. And the details you can see in our fit classes. That's one of the dispensations. That when you're traveling, you know, after making wudu, you can put on valid foot gear, whether it be leather or waterproof, or certainly in the, in the Hanafi school and also in the, the sound opinion of the Shafi school, something that is thick and sturdy, even if not waterproof, such that if you wipe to the wetted hand, the water does not go through. Like woolen socks, for example. Those, once you put them on in wudu, you can wipe for three days. And you should know the details related to that, because that can be helpful when you're traveling. You have to stick your foot in the sink on the air on the plane. If you're if you choose to, to go in your sandals, whatever, then that's up to you. But this is a dispensation. You don't have to take the dispensation. If you take the extra effort to put put in the effort then you have the reward for that. Some people are better at maintaining wudu than others. Right? One of my friends said, you know, wudu is like patience. You try to keep it, but it comes and goes. I travel a lot. I don't have big wudu problems. Even at airports, often if you go to a disabled washroom or anywhere, it's not difficult to wash your feet. But if you want the dispensation to make things easy for yourself as travel, this is one of the sunnah facilitations that we have in the the second one we won't go into at length but in the old days this would be a major thing which is tayammum right dry ablution and if you're going hiking camping or doing some extreme things then you may want to brush up on your rulings related to tayammum because you may end up in a situation where you're stuck high up on the mountain and it's freezing cold, you're not able to make wudu, 
So you can make tayammum. And you learn the rulings related to that. But tayammum rulings are something that are worth knowing outside of that as well. Why? Well, for a traveler. Because you could be in a situation where you have to pray, but you don't have wudu and there's turbulence on the flight. So you cannot go to make wudu. What do you do? What do you do if there's turbulence on the flight and you can't make wudu? Well, you need to pray maghrib. So what do you do? Anyone? Those online could participate as well. There's several things you could do. One of them being make tayammum. How do you make tayammum from your airplane seat? Just keep. In the Hanafi school, certainly there's difference. You learn your own madhab, but in the Hanafi school, you can you can keep a small pebble with you. It doesn't clean flat stone. Keep it in your wallet even. And you can make tayammum on, on a stone. Now, you, that's not a substitute for going to make... That's not a substitute for going to make wudu. But it is certainly very useful in the situations where you're not able to make wudu. Such as you're flying and there's turbulence on the flight, for example. Or elsewhere... Um, you're, you're, you're traveling and you got in an accident or whatever and you're not able to make wudu it's a, it's a useful thing to keep but also travel gives you opportunity to learn something that may benefit you in other occasions people who are hospitalized now you know nobody typically plans my plan for 2024 is I'm going to break a leg and require surgery they said in 2027, I'm going to have a bypass, bypass surgery. We don't know. But if those things happen, then often we don't have the luxury to learn things on the fly. That's why we just learn it once well enough so that when it happens, we know how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So this is the, this, the, the, the first of the dispensations that were mentioned was about wiping over khufs. The second dispensation is second dispensation is tayammum. Right? And for tayammum when you cannot make water, when you cannot use water, in certain in the school, if you have a flat stone, you make the intention of making tayammum in order to be able to pray, make the intention, sunnah say bismillah, you don't have you rub it once. And you wipe your entire face. And then rub it a second time. And you wipe both arms, of course, with your sleeves uncovered, fully and completely. Right? Including interlacing your fingers. That's it. Would take 10 seconds to make tayammum. That's it. And that is extremely useful. And then it's helpful other situations. You, you don't get sick. May Allah pre preserve your health for, for, for a long time. But... It can be also helpful. You have a family member who was hospitalized. The number of cases I've dealt with of somebody who was hospitalized and they got severely harmed because they insisted on going to the washroom to make wudu. If you can't go to make wudu on your own, like if you're, if you're bedridden in hospital, typically you're not just there as a substitute vacation. Right? And if, you, if your definition of going on vacation is that I'll just go to hospital. Right? That's haram because you're wasting public money. Can we agree on that? Right? Don't do that. Right? You say, you know what? I don't want to cook for the next week. I'm going to claim all kinds of bod bodily pains, unidentified sickness. So they put you in hospital. They say, oh, and maybe this is hurting and maybe that's hurting. Why? Because they fe feed you and so on. Not allowed. Haram. Public funds. Right? And if you're on some kind of personal health insurance, probably against the terms of your insurance. Wouldn't be allowed. Right? Um, so, 
in those kinds of situations, someone's hospitalized, they can also make tayammum. So this is useful. When you learn something, for example, in the context of travel, it'll benefit you in other areas as well. The third set of dispensations relate to shortening prayers. There's difference of opinion here. It's not primarily a fiqh class. In the Hanafi school, once you become a traveler, it is wajib to shorten prayers. Shorten prayers meaning the four rakah prayers must be prayed as two rakahs, as long as you are a traveler. That's in the Hanafi school. So the Hanafi school, you shorten prayers and you remain a traveler for 15, you know, while you're traveling and unless you're going to stay somewhere for 15 days. You're a traveler. In the Hanafi school, you must shorten prayers. But in the Hanafi school, we do not combine prayers. In the Hanafi school, we do not combine prayers. So we have 15 days as a traveler. So you go to London, England for 12 days. Or you go to Fes for 13 days. Or you go to Cairo for 14 days. Hanafis, we would be travelers for that whole period. So we shorten our four rakahs prayers, of course, unless you're praying in congregation behind a resident imam. But in the Hanafi school, there isn't combining prayers. In the Shafi'i school, combining prayers, uh, sorry, shortening prayers is optional for the traveler. In the Shafi'i school, shortening prayers is optional. with conditions that they mention. And in the Shafi'i school, you can join Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib and Isha. But you're only a traveler for three days besides the day of arrival and the day of departure. If you get somewhere, in a state of travel, you could combine, but if you get somewhere, you're only a traveler if you're there for three days, minus the day of arrival and departure. So you can't mix between the Hanafi and Shafi'i school. Say, well, I'm Shanafi, you know, such that you do something. Say, I'm, well, I'm resident here for 12 days. I'm staying here for 12 days. So I'm a traveler and I'm going to combine. Because neither school says this is allowed. And those details you, you can study. Now, if a Hanafi, you know, we learn a school of Islamic law and we practice it, but the schools of Islamic law are schools. They are not sects. It's not part of your identity that I am Hanafi. This is a means for you to practice the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ in a sound and consistent manner. But if a Hanafi person wants to take the Shafi'i opinion, just le learn it doesn't take very long to learn it. You, know, you should have, if you have a reference book like Sheikh Noah Keller's translation of Al-Maqasid of Yam Nawi or Reliance of the Traveler, which is slightly more detailed, you have that. You check up, maybe ask a chef, you know, I'm traveling, how would I combine prayers? Because it, it gets hectic, and you so. If you're Hanafi, you pray in its time, as is valid. And the beautiful spirit, but oh, how? what is the truth? The Sahaba differed. The Sahaba May Allah be well pleased with them, differed regarding things like this. And they differed passionately but respectfully. One of my favorite incidents from the Sunnah for, or from the Sahaba is that our two of during the time of Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan, they were on a journey when he was a Khalifa. And from morning time, Sayyidina Uthman and Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be well pleased with them both, were in disagreement. Sayyidina Uthman held that when you travel, it's up to you. Do you want to shorten or, or not? And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, who was known as the most learned of the companions after the four Khulafa, he held the same opinion as later the Hanafis would. That no, you must shorten. And all morning, they're discussing the issue. Because this is deen. And it's getting quite passionate about it. 
But then t time came for Dhuhr. Who would lead? Sayyidina Uthman, because he's the commander of the believers. Who stood right behind him? Abdullah bin Mas'ud. So one of the people who was there said, Tunkiru alayhi thumma tusalli khalfahu. You disagree with him, yet you pray behind him. He said, Al khilafu sharr. Diverging is evil. That's the difference of opinion between disagreeing and diverging in our opinions. Disagreeing is, I think this is correct, you think that's correct. I don't think you're correct, but I respect your right to hold that opinion. And it's not, and that's why there's what's called the, the acceptable circle of difference of opinion. The accept, acceptable circle of difference of opinion. That which is within the sound framework of religious disagreement. And by definition, the opinions contained within the four schools of Sunni Islam are all in the circle of accepted difference of opinion. So therefore, someone who follows any one of these opinions is fulfilling the divine command, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ ذِكْرِ Ask the people of remembrance, if you know not. And that's from the beauty of our religion. That doesn't mean that anyone can come with any opinion. Uncle Sufyan says, well, the way I see it, I'm a traveler in life. So I will shorten and combine my prayers all life. So Uncle Sufyan, stay in your lane and though in your opinion, you know, in that regards, once Imam Abu Hanifa was sitting with the students and they're just relaxed right? amongst, you know, amongst companions. So he, he had his feet stretched out after presumably a long day of teaching. Then a man came in and sat down with him. So Abu Hanifa crossed his legs and sat up. After a while, Abu Hanifa leaned back again and, and stretched his legs. And the man went. And Abu Hanifa was respectful and so on. But So his students asked him, Imam, what happened? He said, when the man came in, I thought that he was deserving of respect. So I crossed my legs and sat, and sat up. But then when he started speaking, I realized that he wasn't. So I relaxed. So, you know, uh, the, well, they, he didn't disrespect him, but he just relaxed. Okay? Um, so, this, so these are two of the dispensations that one should know about. But the way of dealing with difference of opinion is beautiful. That if you are traveling with someone who follows another school, the basis is both parties take the other person's opinion in mind. So I used to travel a lot with my dear friend, you know, fellow teacher at Seeker's Guidance, Sheikh Herodis, and he would always want to pray at the beginning of the first time, and he would combine prayers in the state of travel. And I would generally pray behind him. Um, and being staunch Hanafi, I would also pray the prayer at its due time. But Sheikh Yahya would remind me, he'd elbow me, he loves to elbow me, and say, Asr Zin. Like we're on the plane, for example, we're sitting together, Asr Zin. Because he knows I'm going to pray Asr in its own time as well. And that's the, that's the way, you know, things, we've had you know, similar situations that we're, we're traveling um, and we, you know, you're in a place, He's already prayed the prayers together. He, you know, he'd say, Let, let's stop because, you know, let, let's have Asr, you know, in congregate, you know, we could catch the Asr congregation because we have someone, you know, who follows the other position. So that's, that's the respect of people in difference. If people travel in a group, etc., these are things that they should discuss. That you're traveling a group of friends, some follow one opinion, some follow the other. That's part from the beauty and diversity of our religion. People talk about all kinds of diversity. We have, you know, mechanisms for principled religious diversity. It's not just anything goes diversity, but this is diversity of opinion that arises out of a principled commitment to the truth. Okay. So that's another of the dispensations. So now when you are a traveler, also, 
the traveler does not have to pray Salatul Jumu'ah. And you should know the rulings related to Salatul Jumu'ah if you're traveling for a time. Jumu'ah prayer is not something that you can just establish on your own. So three families travel by, by road. They decide to go from, from Toronto all the way to Vancouver by, you know, to drive across Canada. And you don't take the U.S. shortcut. You go around the Great Lakes and everything. So you do that. It's going to take you three weeks. Can you pray Jumu'ah in on the road? So the three cars can't just say, okay, we'll just you know, go to a parking lot at the gas station and do Salatul Jumu'ah. Salatul Jumu'ah is something that has conditions. Now on the way, if you stop in different towns and you pray Jumu'ah there, there's great merit and there's great benefit. One of the benefits of traveling is to meet other believers. There's great wisdom and benefit and you know, getting to know others in other places. And you see the beauty and diversity of, of religion and our religious communities. And it's amazing. Sometimes, you know, if, we're, if you're in, in, a, in a big, ci big city, you're used to there being, you know, like if you're in Toronto, you have... So many religious halal options are sometimes good to see how people in small towns etc., still have a lot of struggle just to, to get the basic access and they sacrifice even to be able to have halal meat and all these things. So, But Jumu'ah is not obligatory on the traveler. If you're in a state of rest, it's better if you're in a state of rest. You're in London for 13 days or you're in... Cairo for 13 days. And what are you doing in Cairo for 13 days? You're just chilling out. Then it is more encouraged for you to do Juma. But if you're in the Russia, but it's not obligatory. But if you're in the rush of travel, for the traveler, they don't have to do Juma. That's up, up to you. A neglected sunnah. So the fifth dispensation related to travel. So we saw we have wiping over footgear. Secondly, tayammum. Third, shortening prayers. Wajib in the Hanafi school when you're a traveler. The Shafi'is have a choice. Combining prayers, which Shafi'is do. Hanafis don't, but it's one. A Hanafi person wants to follow the Shafi'i opinion. Let's say someone who travels a lot. They're a sales agent, they travel a lot. Then just check what the rulings are in the chef school. Only once do you consult with a qualified scholar. Okay, did I get, am I getting this right? And then, khalas, you're acting on the basis of knowledge. Um, number five is, it is from the sunnah to do nafil prayers while on your mode of transportation outside city limits once you're outside city limits you can perform nafil prayers not the fard seated whether you you are like in the old days if you're riding a donkey horse a donkey mule horse or camel in our times that would apply if you're riding a donkey mule horse or camel or if you're driving a car riding a motorbike on a bus, train, plane, or other modes of transportation, you could do nafil prayers outside city limits, not within the city limits. And you don't have to be a traveler for that. You're just going from Toronto to Hamilton. Once you leave the, the limits of the greater Toronto area, you can do nafil prayers in your car with head movements. And you don't have to face the Qibla. Even if your back is the Qibla. That's one of the things you can do. What do you do on long journey? You could see the Fard. The Fard you have to do standing. Facing the Qibla, etc. But Sunnah prayers you can do. Seated with head movements. Seated with head movements. And this is something the Prophet ﷺ himself 
did. And we, you know, there's hadiths related by, by both Bukhari and Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ used to pray on his, on his mount, on his animal, um, in whichever direction the animal faced. And that is understood to have been from other hadiths, the nafil prayers, the nafil prayers. But the fard, one has to do standing because it's very, it's very, very clear. So even when you're flying, etc., you have to at least attempt to pray the fard standing. On depend, it depends on the plane. Many planes, there are, there is space at the back, sometimes in the middle, where there's space. If you ask them about praying. So before the time, just like anything else, you take the means, you ask, there's ample t place to pray, or they'll make space for you, um, and, and you pray. Sometimes, depending on airlines, some Muslim airlines, they want to teach you your fiqh, say, no, 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 you can pray seated. And the time there, the practical thing, you know, non muslims will just let, let you do whatever you want to do. But some, some Muslim airlines, the Muslims say, no, 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 you have to pray seated. And if you're for example, they're Arab, they, they see you're not Arab, they say, no, 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 this is, you know. And the way you deal with that is, you know, religion is not up for discussion. It's, religion is not democratic, right? It's divine. <laughs> so, so you just say, shukar, could I just pray there, please? Thank you. And sometimes, you know, but that's also, it's good to know when you choose airlines, if you have, if you frequently travel, which airlines are more accommodating and which are less accommodating? Now, by and large, people, and, and sometimes people feel shy. There are two types of shyness. There's many types of shyness, but one definition of shyness is there's their shyness from people and their shyness from Allah. Shyness with people is praiseworthy when you are shy from doing what is unbecoming by religious standards and people serve as a reminder so for example you know sister jill was wearing her pajamas she just put on her hijab and she was going to go throw out the garbage in her pajamas and then she saw her friend standing in the balcony. So she went back home, put on something more dignified. That's good shyness from people. Why? Because it held you back from behaving in, in an undignified manner. Pajamas are not something we wear outside. I have a friend of mine who was a student. When in, now he's a very distinguished scholar. When we were in Damascus, he went to throw out the garbage in his pajamas and like an undershirt without his head covered. And he's a student of knowledge. His landlord wearing a t-shirt with his head uncovered, but wearing trousers. He said, say the so-and-so. It pains us to see you like that. Why? Because you're a student of knowledge. There's a dignity to you. My friend wanted to say, but <laughs> you're, you're not. And his, his landlord was doing some, you know, some repair work on the pipes or something. So he was dressed in that. But there's a dignity to the believer. So when you're reminded because of people from not behaving in an undignified way, then that's a good shyness from people. And the safe way in dealing with that is you take that as a reminder to do what's more pleasing to Allah. You're, you're praying, or at home, you're praying and you didn't have your cap on, for example. And you saw that so Jack was praying that way. He saw Uncle Bill, Jill's father, comes in and his friends come in. How do you keep that sincere? That you correct your action for the sake of Allah. That is good shyness with people, but the, the way of safety is to do that for the sake of Allah. You are really hungry. You're eating with both hands and you're using the, your little finger to stuff in the food from the sides, right? To maximize, you know, the bite in mouth ratio, the BMR. 
and you saw your friends come in and you're like, <laughs> you know, so you fix your conduct, the safety to keep your heart clear. You, you feel embarrassed. Okay, let me eat properly. But you do it for the sake of Allah. And then you remind yourself, sunnah, say bismillah, right hand, chew properly, etc. But for the sake of Allah, not just for their sake. The blameworthy shyness from people is when you leave what is right out of concern for people. What will people say? And the plain, brutal reality is firstly, you're not that important and no one really cares. <laughs> to be honest. People are doing all kinds of wacky things. If you spend long enough observing, one of the good things to do when you're traveling by plane is to take a walk down the corridor. There's people who are doing stretches and calisthenics and doing all kinds of things. There's people, you know, who are, you know, like, yeah, they suddenly go into like a stretch and they're like two thirds naked, all kinds of madness going on. And you're just standing in a corner just praying. Right? And the simple thing, don't argue with anybody. Some people give you bad looks, just keep smiling. Smiling is a beautiful argument because it's very hard to argue with a smile. There's, you know, the, the anti Anti-Islam Council of you know, of Canada, all seated in a certain area. Lower your gaze. If you don't see them, you won't notice their frowns. What are you going to do? How many times has anyone been beaten up on a flight? Heard that recently? Now wacky things happen. Wacky things happen. But wacky things happen. There's not much you can do to stop them, anyways. But practically, nothing does happen. Just go, do your thing, and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Even through 9-11, things were tense. Religious Muslims prayed on planes. Nothing really happened. Right? The number of cases of there being issues were negligible. A lot of them due to ignorance. The simple way of dealing with it is, you know, you talk to, to one of the flight attendants beforehand, and one of the, you know, the practical tips is you just make small talk beforehand. You know you're going to have to pray in the next hour. You just go, uh, you know, could I have a cup? So I'd say, you know, thank you for your, you know, like, whatever. You, know, you make that human connection first. Then, frankly, you can do whatever you want. Very often. And they're familiar. You're not the only Muslim traveling. I've had many, many times. Uh, I usually keep a, have a scarf on me or so, something. I'll just put it down. Say, just hold on, sir. I'll, I'll bring you something to put on the ground. And they'll grab a blanket, put it. Say, no, I'm, I'm fine. Right? I just want to do my... Because you know, I can do the sunnah on my seat. I just want to do my fardha. You know, by the time they get the blanket, I would have been finished my prayer. And that's... You know, that's something that... Um, but sometimes on certain short flights, etc., there isn't a place because you can't block the public way. So you go check. If there's no place, then you can pray on your seat. So that is um, the, the fifth dispensation. The sixth is that when you're a traveler, you, you don't fast. When you're a traveler, you don't fast. Meaning that it's not obligatory to, for you to fast in Ramadan. The traveler does not have to fast the Ramadan fast. But there's a couple, there's three considerations to keep in mind. The first is that while it is not obligatory to fast in Ramadan when you're traveling, there's a general principle mentioned in the verses of travel, which is, وَأَنْتَصُومُ خَيْرُ لَكُمْ And for you to fast is better for you. For you to fast is better for you. What does that entail? It entails exactly that. For you to fast is better for you. That is. If you can fast without hardship, there's reward in doing so. And there is reward in doing so. So don't don't miss out, you know. Especially if it's an easy journey. Right? You're flying from Toronto to, to, to Paris. And you know, when you go east, what happens? You're leaving. At six in the morning 
eight hour flight and but also there's seven hour time difference so eight hour flight what time are you going to get there 6 a.m here is 2 p.m there right by the time you get there it'll be maghrib so you're gonna have a nine hour fast it's very simple okay? let's say it depends what time of the year is it that difficult to do a nine hour fast is it no so when you can so Allah SWT says when tasumu khair look for you to fast is better for you like when if you can fast without hardship or you're someone who travels a lot you're traveling all the time it'll be difficult for you to make up the fast later so just fast or you're in Ramadan in you know you went in Ramadan you know, you booked your vacations to, uh, to Damascus. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you know, peace and, and well-being return to them. You went to Damascus for summer vacation, for, for vacations. You got a special deal, turns out it's in Ramadan. Firstly, in a Muslim country, you'd be, be kind of hard-pressed to, to eat anyways during the day. It's kind of foolish. You're there for two weeks and you're missing out on the opportunity of fasting. Just fast. Okay, just fast. Um, so that's another of the of the dispensations in um, in Ramadan uh, in, in for the traveler that you can um, skip fasting. There is one important proviso, though, according to the majority of the scholars, if you are resident when. Fajr time enters, you are obligated to fast that day, even if you travel afterwards. So, you know, you're, you're flying from Toronto to Fes, Morocco. Your flight is 9 a.m. Fajr time comes in 7 a.m., let's say. When Fajr time came in, you are a resident. According to the Hanafi school, the Shafi'i school, and the Maliki school, you are obligated to fast, to complete the fast of that day, unless it becomes unduly difficult for you. And that's often forgotten, because you know, if you're going to travel, learn the fiqh related to travel. This is one of the components. That in Ramadan, if you, init, if you travel after Fajr time enters, like, then you must complete the fast of that day. There's a dispensation in the Hanbali school, which is that if you are resident when Fajr time came in, you're allowed to break the fast once you've left city limits. So if you have a friend, if you're with somebody who takes that opinion, this is within the four schools of Sunni Islam, so you cannot criticize them or condemn them or etc. If someone finds it difficult, they can, you know, it's best to take dispensation on the basis of knowledge if you choose to do it. So these are some of the dispensations related to travel. Um, also, one should plan the time during one's travel fruitfully. How? Because you're not necessarily working during travel, although some people are. But this is a good time to plan the hours of travel with the meaningful. And we talked about that in the beginning. Right? Have a plan. Okay, I want to, since I'm traveling, I have, say so you have a road trip. You're driving from Toronto to Knoxville, Tennessee. What, what, 12, 14 hours? Uh, Uncle G, could you check? How long is it by road from Toronto to Knoxville? Could you check? Yeah. So, so you're driving. Nobody's saying you have to listen to Quran the whole way. But let's say it's a, you, over two days, you're, you're going to have, I think it's 14 hours, 12, 14 hours driving time. Assuming speed limits are observed. How much? 13 hours. Right? 
And a journey being that long, probably split it over two days. So this is one of the opportunities of travel. You, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not expect from us. Allah deserves everything in our life. But we say, okay. So I'm breaking the travel into two parts. So let me listen to an hour of Quran on day one, hour of Quran on day two, for example. Half an hour, whatever you can. So you plan out, you should plan your deen like you plan your dunya. Sometimes, of course, you plan your dunya discreetly. We, we drove several times to Knoxville, well, we, my wife. I was, but I planned the journey. I didn't tell her we stopped in a particular city because they had, they used to have the best Turkish restaurant that I was aware of. We didn't used to have good Turkish restaurants in, in the greater Toronto area. So I said, we're going to go this way. And I was handling the GPS because I had a discreet plan. So we stopped there. I learned this from my father. So we stopped there. I said, okay, we're going to stop for lunch here. So I took, she was driving. I was taking care of the itinerary. So you plan your, you know, and you plan your dunya, but you also plan your deen. You choose wh where you're gonna stay for a hotel, etc. And the believer plans because when you travel, for example, by, by by road, you can get much better hotels at much lower rates if you stay outside the outside big cities with just a little bit of planning. It takes few minutes. You save lots of money. You can get a really nice place, especially if you travel with family. You know, momentary planning. Sometimes even, you know, like when you travel, if you go inside the, the, the hotel and ask how much is it, and you go into the parking lot and on their Wi-Fi, and you book it online, you can book it for 30% cheaper. Right? Simple things. You don't have to go outside. I just felt guilty doing it in the lobby. So I just stepped outside. Then wonder why did I step into the into the parking lot. I just felt a bit guilty. that. Um, so you plan your deen. Said, okay, I want to do some Quran. Say, okay, I'm going to do some dhikr. You, know, you plan out, maybe listen to something beneficial. One of the things we used to do as a family when we travel, we used to travel a lot by land as well, is take some, some ser you know, have some series that you listen to. You can do that in your, your daily commutes, which is a lesser travel. Oh my God, I have a long commute every day. What do you do? I listen to the radio. What do you listen to the radio? The, the, the morning news, which is basically everything's fine in Canada. Basically. Right? Everything's fine in Canada. Right? There's parts of the world right, where, you know, I was, there was a bit of, you know, I was in Karachi a, a, a while back, 15 years ago, and I, I heard... I'd heard before heading out that there was there were two rival political parties were having a gunfight. So I asked the, 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 the driver, so why is he taking this route? Say well, Sheikh Ji, there's some gunfighting between this political party and the other party. Is everything okay? So, yeah, it's fine, only five, six deaths. Right? And it's like some part of the world. I said, but isn't aren't you afraid? I said no. Karachi has whatever, 15 million people. So if six people died, six people will die anyways. Right? And some parts of the world, sadly, that's how, you know. And it's actually, at one level, it's practical. What, what is the statistical risk of you dying from the six, you know, if there's six deaths by gunshots? Anyways, that's a separate matter. But practically, what are you doing in your commute? You should plan it. Some Quran, some dhikr. Listen to some beneficial knowledge. Or make some calls. Make some calls. Call friends. Call family. Okay. All friends and family over here are headed, also headed to work. But you could call people overseas. And there's lots of things you can do to make the most of that travel time. Um, also just to rest. Simple thing. Rest. And rest is, you know, just go to, go to sleep. It's ibadah. Go to sleep. Sleep is better than, than foolishness. Right? <laughs> you know? If, uh, so that's some of the, uh, some of the guidance related to, um, to travel. And that 
completes the section from Imam Ghazali's Ihya on travel. In the next two sessions, we'll look at something really important, which is Imam Nawawi has 77 adab, 77 sunnas related to travel. So we look at all of them in summary from his work, Al Majmu'a Sharh Al Muhadhab. It's a beautiful thing on the proper manners of travel. And then after that, we will look at an issue that we looked at recently in the Tariq Al Muhammadiyya, which is um, on what's called audition, as sama', which is spiritual listening, spiritual listening, whether it be spiritual music or spiritual poetry and the like. And that also includes, because audition is listening for religious purposes, that also includes listening to Qur'an. And, um, and there's also, of course, one of the reasons this chapter is important. Many people misrepresent the position of Imam al-Ghazali, that Imam al-Ghazali permitted music. And we'll see that in brief um, as well, that what exactly was he talking about? See it from his own words, bi ta'ala. Before we close, we have a, a, a couple of questions um, that um, is it okay to see if to use so in the Hanafi school what about the, what kind of stone can you use for a tayammum in the Hanafi school anything that's from the natural surface of the earth you can use for a tayammum anything that's from the natural surface of the earth you can use so a stone and you don't have to have dust. Now, learn your school, but in our, like if someone's going to a hospital or if you're going to a place, you can't take dust with you on a plane. Right? So that, that's what works in the Hanafi school. Um, if you follow another method, learn what to do accordingly. Um, if someone has studied Shafi Fiqh, but generally follows Hanaf the Hanafi school, if a need arose to combine prayer as a traveler, could they do so? The duty of, for the believer is that anything they do, they do so in a manner that is valid according to a school of mainstream Islam. Because Allah, because why do we follow qualified scholarship? Because we. It is to answer the divine command that فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of remembrance if you know not. So, so this is a logical statement. If you, do, if you do not know, ask the people of remembrance. How do you ask the people of remembrance? Either directly by asking them or by referring to their teachings. So that is, and this is a matter where there's some difference of opinion. There are, you know, because in itself, you know, the duty of the believer, the, what a believer should do is learn one school and practice it. That is what an educated believer would do. Right? You learn one school and then you focus on, on being devoted with sincerity, act with, in accordance with sunnah, with excellence, and so on. And get on with life. But you are not morally bound to stick to one school in everything. That's up to you. If you want to be more cautious and stick to one school, there's benefits, because that's a standard of taqwa. It's a standard of taqwa. But sometimes there are, you know, there are situations where there's difficulty, hardship, etc., so there's leeway. One of the ways to simplify life is to consult. To consult. Yeah. Yeah. If Shafi's are playing praying earlier in congregation, can I join them? Yes, because the earlier Shaf uh, earlier Asr time is a valid opinion in the Hanafi school. Is it? No, no, but no, deen is not by hearsay. I've heard this. No. Does, do qualified Maliki scholars allow the keeping of dogs indoors 
for rec for non you know so no that's you know so so that's where you know we don't take religion by hearsay right right you take a in anything in any field of life we you know you know, someone says you know, you're going to buy a $120,000 car why my my nephew's son was saying that he thought those were good cars no you go check you know you check and don't just read any random review you make sure you read the right reviews so we should take deen at least as seriously as we take dunya so um so the the madikis are a little more expansive on dogs but there's very clear ahadith of the of the prophet sallallahu what has been allowed within you know is keeping a dog as a guard dog but you keep that outside of your house or to keep a shepherd dog in our times if someone needs a a dog well as a guide dog for example for they're blind etc in these these kinds of ways um and even that like you know if you're in canada where do you need a guard dog right because by any objective standard you know, even the roughest parts of town in Toronto, the greater Toronto area, are by any global st historical standard, even global standards, it's boringly safe. You go to Jane, like places like Jane and Finch have a bad rep. Anyone been to Jane and Finch? It's boring. You say, oh, it's so dangerous. Like, to Toronto, no, just travel a little bit, see what goes on in the world. Like, and see what historically used to go on. So th that's over overrated. Um, so there's another question. What is the ruling of wiping over thin socks? Right. So that's a detailed question. The um, there are different schools of Islamic law regarding that. In the Hanafi school, the so basically what is est clearly established from the Prophet Sallallahu is he wiped over hoofs. In the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, hoofs were made of leather. So then, in the Maliki school, foot gear must be from leather to be able to wipe on it, with the other conditions. They took the it being leather as a necessary condition. In the other schools, no, leather is a descriptive, is a descriptor of the of the of what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wiped over. You can wipe over other things that share the characteristics of the leather footgear, which are, they are thick and sturdy. And then within the schools of Islamic law, there are, there's a range of opinions. So the Malikis predominantly require leather. But what we mentioned, both Hanafi and Shafi school, they have to be thick, sturdy, and you, you need to be able to walk extensively in them. The stronger position in the Shafi school, they have to be waterproof. We pour water over them, the water doesn't go through. But a sound position in the Shafi school, and that's, what's recommended by a number of leading Shafi jurists of our time, like Habib Zain ibn Sumayt. And the main position in the Hanafi school is this, this sock or the you know, socks, for example, fulfilling the condition of khuf would entail. They're thick such that you can't see through them. They stay on the foot without having to be tied. And if you wiped over them with a dripping wet hand, the water wouldn't get, go through right away. And you can walk extensively in them. Most socks you can walk extensively on. And we've thoroughly tested that over many, not myself, but convinced others to do it over many years, male and female. So the key condition is they have to be thick if you can't see through them. And yeah, so basically thick socks, thick and sturdy socks you can wipe over, thin socks you can't. If you want to wipe, just get the right socks. Even in the summer, I spent several summers deliberately wearing woolen socks. You get like, for example, merino wool socks, they're not that expensive. And they're actually very comfortable. I didn't believe it, so I just got some, wore them in summer. It's actually very comfortable. They, you know, they're, why? There's some science behind it, but I thought about it. Well, you know, animals, you know, they don't lose their wool in the summer. They don't die. So I said, there must be something to it. Anyways, you test it. You want to wipe? Do that. Right? 
Learn how to wipe over hoofs and do accordingly. If you're unable to pray standing in the plane or other space, or if you're... Um, then... Yeah, so... If you can't stand, there's... The Prophet ﷺ said, Salli qa'iman. Pray standing. Then pray sitting down. Sitting down means sitting on the ground with prostration. Pray sitting down with prostration, which means, for example, if the plane is turbulent, you, you go to the back and you pray facing the Qibla, sitting on the ground because it's turbulent. Not, not turbulent enough that they force you to sit down, but for whatever reason. Or sometimes it happens certain trains or they wobble. I took the Orient Express, which is neat, doesn't, you know, which from Damascus, used to, supposed to go all the way to the Hijaz, but I went Damascus to Amman on it. Literally, it was like a roller coaster ride, even though it didn't go more than 40 kilometers an hour. Like, you know, trains go, koo, chuk, chuk, but they go, chuk, chuk, chuk. This went, koo, chuk, chuk, but this went, chuk. And by car, the journey takes three hours plus the border. It took 12 hours. It was amazing. But at no point were we able to pray standing up. My friend tried. He broke his prayer. Um, Alhamdulillah, it stopped many times. We prayed Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib on the ground. Um, so, but sitting down, Qu'ud in Arabic means sitting on the ground i.e. with prostration. Only if you can't stand nor sit on the ground with prostration, could you pray seated. But then you pray seated, then what's happening with facing the Qibla? Because there are conditions for the validity of the prayer. Um, that's where, you know, the... Um, you know, the our religion is not difficulty, but at the same time, they say if you behave like a doormat, people will walk all over you. Just do the right thing. Do the right thing. And if you feel shy, just raise your hands and say, Ya Rab, Ya Rab, Ya Rab, or just make quick dua. If you feel shy, close your eyes. Don't look around. Like when you're a kid and you're taking the candy, what do you do? Look down so no one sees. You know, it just, you know. So I'm not telling you to go steal candy, but if you're, you know, if you're about to do some mischief here, you're just trying to do the right thing. Don't look around. Just go straight. And and people do it all the time. People do it all the time. No, no. So once you become resident, so if you're traveling, you go somewhere and you're going to be resident there, once you make, it counts with the intention by which you are there. So if you're going to be there for X, more than the, the period of time, then you're, you're a resident. So you act accordingly. Um, alhamdulillah. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for ease and assistance and facilitation. وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين